Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And today I have the pleasure of introducing all of you to Sammy Eastwood. So Sammy, say hello to the listeners. Hi. (laughs) Sammy, we're so um, excited to have you on the podcast. So let's do a little bit of setup for everybody. Why don't you start um, with telling us what state in the Northwest you live in? Um, I live in Oregon, uh, pretty much right smack in the center. (laughs) Ah, Central Oregon. So it's kind of warm right now, huh? (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's so hot here. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So listeners, as we're taping it, we're in August. So that means (laughs) cooking. (laughs) Yep. We just got, um, we, I'm in Southwest Washington, so I'm north of you quite a bit, but Mm. um, we don't get as warm weather as you do, but we just had our 90 degree weather and my AC went out. I called out two days before we were supposed to get the weather. I called our AC guys and like oh that part's gonna take a week and I'm like you're kidding <laughs> we finally are getting hot weather and I don't have AC <laughs> oh that's awful typical yeah, Washington scenario yeah, really there's nothing worse <laughs> yeah our four days of hot weather and I'm dying <laughs> <laughs> I love it. so Sammy tell us a little bit about yourself um do you I I read on your bio so I know a little bit about you but Fill in the listeners a little bit. Do you have a job? I know that I know a little bit about your schooling. So share with us where you're at, what you're doing. Um, Well, right now I don't have like an actual job. I'm doing an internship at the Deschutes Historical Museum, which is here in town. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do that Tuesdays, Thursdays, and that's really, really fun. And it works with, you know, the degree I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get a double major in English and history. Ah, Um, Good degrees. <laughs> yeah, and it's so, so interesting working there. I just, uh, every day I learn something new. That That's so cool. So um, so when having that degree is going to definitely lend to your writing. I know what genre yeah. you write in, so we'll get there in a minute. But um, <laughs> I think that's awesome. And the historical museums are so fantastic. If mm-hmm. you're an author and you don't visit historical museums in every city you go into, then I really encourage you to do it. You're going to get so many ideas. <laughs> yeah, because this museum focuses mostly on the Deschutes County, but there's also, um, you know, a bigger museum that's more aimed at like all of Oregon. So like the Oregon Trail and the Native Americans. And it's, it's really, really great. I love it. Well, good. I'm glad you're doing that. That's fantastic. And and if I read right, you're writing as you're putting yourself through school. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Good so, girl. <laughs> it can be a little stressful sometimes, especially when I'm like working against the clock on both sides. Mm-hmm. Like my writing schedule was pretty intense this last semester. I was doing three chapters a week and doing three classes. So goodness, you are a brave girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I commend you because I know how hard school is. I work with Thank students you. every day, so I know where you're at. <laughs> and, and I went back to school as an adult student with kids, so I <sighs> could have never have um, done that and write. So now I'm doing my writing now. But um, oh, That's great. So, wow, you're ahead of the game, and that's great. <laughs> already published, which is so super cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I like to ask this question. I don't think it's one that I prepared you for because I like a couple stumper questions. (laughs) (laughs) So um, we as authors are always told um, to always be reading, you know, make sure you're reading something. It doesn't have to be in your genre, but be reading. So I like to ask the authors when they come on, what are you currently reading, if anything? Um, well, right now, my siblings and I, we have a kind of like book club that we do at night oh, cool, cool. where we, we read out loud to each other. And right now I'm reading Wildwood by Colin Malloy. I, don't I know love that. Wildwood. I read that book. Did Fantastic. you? Yes, I did. Loved we, it. We're not even halfway through. Oh my gosh. It's so long. I love it though. It's, it's getting really interesting. Mm, it does. It's a little slow getting into it, but boy, once you're in it, you're like, oh my goodness, this is so good. So good. Good. Um, Very cool. So you read out loud. Do you guys take turns? How many are there? Um, there's three of us right uh-huh. now. Uh-huh. And um, my sister is reading Podkin One Ear. I think it's like a middle grade book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a really, really good. And, you know, she would read like 
maybe a chapter or like half a chapter until she's done and then I'll read and then we'll just go to bed. <laughs> That's so super cool though, because yeah. um, that is such a skill to be able to read out loud for others. Yeah. And people don't realize how beneficial that skill is and it helps with everything besides just you um, articulating the book and getting it in, you know, taking it in as you read out loud. But as authors, we're asked to read often parts mm-hmm. of our books and reading out loud is very scary. <laughs> yeah. So. It also helps with like how many books we get to read per year because mm-hmm. during the day we're all just so busy. So, and you know, I'm always getting asked like, oh, how many books do you read a year? And I'm like, oh no, I've only read one or two books. But then I realize, you know, at night we're reading these books. So, so I'm like, count of, you're double counting. Yeah, it's really great. You guys are smart. <laughs> smart, smart. I love it. I wish I had started that with my kids and they're little, maybe we'll do that with the grandkids someday in the future when I have them. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I loved reading to the kids. That's the one thing that I enjoyed doing. Um, but I never even thought of having them read to each other. So, <laughs> you guys are smart. So... So tell us, Sam, uh, or Sammy, I'm sorry. I don't know if you could like Either one is fine. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about when you realized that you were going to be an author. Um, did you, had you always been writing, creating stories, and then you decided you were going to do this? Um, tell us kind of that moment. Well, I felt like around the time when I was 14, I'm 21 right now, by the way, mm-hmm. and there was just a lot of pressure to decide what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I just, I couldn't figure it out. I felt like everyone around me already had it figured out, even though they didn't because they're 14. Exactly. (laughs) You know, you feel this pressure, even if it's not real. And I didn't like, I really loved writing poetry, but it wasn't like structured and formatted. And I thought it had to be this way and it just wasn't. So I didn't really accept the fact that I wanted to be a writer until I was about 17 because I thought I wanted to be an artist. Oh, well, writers are artists, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so not very um, far from the idea. <laughs> yeah. I I just like, I kept writing and writing more than I was doing art until, you know, and then I was 17 and I had kind of finished the first version of Blackstone Asylum but I never really considered myself writing until I was like 19. And then I was actually doing it full or like not full time, but just more. And I realized, you know, this is where I've fallen. (laughs) This is where I'm going to stay. That's so fantastic. And I'm excited that you discovered it early, you know, in your world. Mm -hmm. Um, I was Okay, truth be told, I got married at 19, so I was a little preoccupied. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, and had our babies right away, running really, really soon. And I had always written when the kids were napping, when they were little, but I never told anyone. My husband knew, but nobody else knew. So it wasn't until I was, I'm almost in my mid forties. And this last year I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to claim this. I'm an author. I'm a writer. I'm going to do this. So it took me a long time to get there. (laughs) So I think it's fantastic that you discover that this is what you want to do. So I commend you and I'm excited to, to um, see as you develop because you already have one book out and that is like the big hurdle getting that first book out right (laughs) it was so hard yeah yeah so tell us let's start about your um, writing process when you you said you were trying to get three chapters a week done while in school do you have a routine do you map out did you map out the story or did the story all just come to you at once and you had to get it all out on paper and then you edited? So <laughs> yeah. what's your version? Um, with Asylum, a lot of, um, I started writing with my sister and we're still writing together, like right. two different authors in the same book. Mm-hmm. And um, we, let's see, I'm trying to like rethink. Blackstone Asylum started out as a really big mess because I didn't plot anything out beforehand. Mm -hmm. But when I rewrote it, um, we plotted everything out beforehand. And then basically, because we were trying to... (laughs) I'm going to admit this. But um, (laughs) Blackstone Asylum was out and it was in a horrible stage where it was just a mess. And Stephen King came out with a pretty much identical story. Oh, no. (laughs) And his book, it's still not out yet. I don't think it's coming out until September 10th. But we were like, oh, my goodness, we have to beat Stephen King to the punch. (laughs) So they were like, look, you need to replot this. You need to finish this, you know, 
in, I think it was like, I was going to finish it in August, but then I ended up finishing it in July instead. Mm -hmm. And we were just going to spend all the time between when I finished it and when Stephen King's book came out to just market it, just Uh get it out there and say, you know, I did it first. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's why it's so intensive. I'm hoping in the future, they're not all that way because that was really hard. But But you obviously had a fantastic story and idea. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Okay. So when you say they were, are you independent published? Are you self-published or is it, um, are you with one of the publishing houses? Um, I'm self-published with Uh Amazon, but as far as like company goes, I'm, um, my parents own Miley Kai Creates. Okay. And they made a facet of it called Miley Kai Publishing, which I'm a part of. Fantastic. Very yeah. cool. So your parents had some involvement in that. Were they your they were very supportive? Um, they're my beta readers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Very um, cool. So what what's the create part of their business? They do Amazon too. They do paint by numbers and recently they started doing fake succulents. <laughs> Oh, so super cool. Oh, that's a huge market. Very big market. Like I love plants and my daughter keeps telling me to stop buying live plants, just buy the fake succulents to live longer. (laughs) We do that too, because I don't know how many succulents I've killed. People say they're so hardy, but they're not. not. No, I overwater mine constantly and everyone's like just leave it alone Vicky and I'm like it's me <laughs> it's so true I know I love it great market how fun is that yeah so it sounds like you have a super supportive family is, oh yeah is that your only support group or do you have other writers that you work with um I once I finished Blackstone Asylum I sent it to an author who had who has, she has it. It's a beta reading site where she like goes through and finds inconsistencies with your story. Uh And, um, so she helped me and I also have another editor named CJ, Uh (laughs) CJ Sky. Uh And she went through and did all like line editing. You know, I'm not very good at putting in commas and things. Oh no, there's, that is definitely something that most of us don't care about. (laughs) We just want to get the story. (laughs) Somebody else worry about that. Exactly. So when they were finished, I read it or no, Jody, my sister read it out loud to my family. I'm really bad at reading my own stuff. Oh, okay. (laughs) So she read it out loud to them and they say, they say, you know, yay or nay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, being self-published, you know, I, and my, my readers, my, sorry, my listeners know that they're going to get to go to the show notes and see your beautiful website. I love your website, by the way. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm a connoisseur of author websites because I see plenty of them. <laughs> and, yeah. um, I love yours. Nice and clean. Um, and yes. Squarespace. We had to rework it. Did you? Yeah. yeah well, I love Squarespace. They're yeah. so nice. You guys did a fantastic job. Um, Sammy, who did the cover art for your book? Because it's it's very good too. I see a lot of I see a lot of cover art too. <laughs> <laughs> so I did my own original cover art in the beginning. There was a horrible version that was my oh. drawing. Oh, but um, we wanted it to be a little more dramatic, so we yeah. went to Fiverr and we hired. Um, her username is German Creative, mm-hmm. but oh my goodness, she's amazing. She created this design and we all loved it. I love it. It's so fantastic. So you'll have to send me her contact. So I'll put it in show notes and then she can get really busy from people that hear about it. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's amazing. Yeah. She did such a great job. Beautiful. So are you doing all, you and your family doing all the marketing yourself? Is that uh, the angle you're going? Um, Because you already Um, got a great start with the website. (laughs) Originally, we decided that we were going to do the marketing, but we realized recently that we need a little more help. Mm -hmm. Um, So we, I have paid for a service on Bowker, which it's um, a consultation with, um, you know, one of their media experts who can kind of help us out a little bit in where in the direction we should go. They it, they personalize it for you, which is really nice. So do they they do all the social media and marketing media and that kind of thing? Do they get mm-hmm. are they like a, a public relations managing company? Bowker does a lot of stuff. Like they can give you INSBs and nice. yeah, they're just 
like they can do biblets. It's a lot of stuff in the book community. And this is one of the things that they do. Well, we'll have to put that on show notes too, because that's a resource (laughs) that I didn't hear about. Amazing. Mm. With all my interviews, I haven't heard of that one yet. (laughs) (laughs) So Sam, we'll make sure that's on show notes for our listeners. So, so what are your plans? Um, I, I would assume that this isn't your only book that you want to get out there. Do you, are you working Um, on more? I am working on the second one. Uh, the paranormal series is actually four books. Oh, nice. So I'm <laughs> working on the second one now. And, you know, I'm just going to keep working on the series until it's finished. But I have so many other ideas I want to get to. <laughs> yeah, I know that. So do you create yourself deadlines with your family, you know, as guidance? And I mean, because obviously you had this really big push deadline. You had to get this one out. Mm-hmm. Did you create deadlines for the second, third and fourth book in your mind? Yeah. Um, mostly I, because my sister is so, you know, she's really involved with like our schedule and, you know, our schedule for our other books that we're writing together. Mm -hmm. Um, she wants to make sure that we have time for both. And so, um, my schedule for my second book is not as intense, but there definitely is like deadlines. Yeah. That's smart. So is your sister, your older sister? She's actually my younger sister. Younger sister. Oh, one of the younger <laughs> ones that's pushing. <laughs> yeah, she's she's very, you know, very well put together. Fantastic. Well, you know, as younger kids, we tend to be, I'm the youngest of five. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're very like type B, type A yeah, personalities. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Well, when you guys get that, your first book out together, let's make sure we get you on the show together. That'd be a lot of fun. Oh, that would be on. so fun. <laughs> yeah, I, lo- I love having um, people with different, you know, with another um, author on, it's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, so what is, I mean, just, you've moved to a more marketing scheme where you're going to be working with people as a consultant, but before that, what's a tip that you can give to somebody like me that I don't have a book out yet, but I know that marketing is going to be like the big thing, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) What's a tip you can give me? I would just say, you know, involve yourself in anything and everything people put on your plate. Because you never know what's going to get eyes on your book. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, I don't prefer Facebook as much, but I understand that it is a necessity that, you know, there's a huge, you know, range of people on Facebook who could see my book and potentially want to buy it. So even though I don't like it, it's still something that I have to do. I love it. That's great. Sorry about the dog interrupting. No, you're totally <laughs> fine. My dogs are the same way. They're such yappers. I just never know when it's going to happen. Either, so. <laughs> <laughs> Quick on the mute button. Sorry, listeners. You know, that brings us such a great point. I I do a lot of social media. I do have some help though. My oldest daughter, she is a graphic designer. Oh. And so I, I get quite a bit of help from her. Um, but before that, it was such a challenge because I was like, I don't want to do the social media so much. I'm, I'm, I'm a private person, but then mm-hmm. you feel like you have to not be to be out there. Yeah. But I think you're right. It's a good, it's a good way to get, you know, people to see readers that you might not know are out there for your books. So, mm-hmm. so awesome. Well, let's set the stage. I'm dying to hear about your book. So <laughs> tell us the story. Tell us whatever background you want to give us to the story and then go ahead and launch into the reading for us. Okay, so um, because I did not grow up in Central Oregon, I grew up in California in Lindemar. That's where I had my main character, Andrea, be from. And Andrea is a paranormal, which in this universe basically means she has powers that are beyond what normal people can do. For instance, she can heal any injury, you know, that is within her brain capacity and you know she's 17 years old but the world she's living in is not in a great place they're constantly battling with each other because more paranormals are coming forward and it's just chaotic but she gets sold out by her father who's a doctor and he is very much afraid of her um She basically sells her to Blackstone, who kidnaps her and takes her to Blackstone Asylum, where she meets other kids who have been kidnapped and who also have paranormal abilities. And their goal is to escape. Absolutely creepy. I'm ready to hear it. (laughs) I love this kind of stuff. (laughs) 
All right, I'm just going to be reading chapter one because I feel like it's the most tense chapter without giving too much away. (laughs) The chill of the early spring fog seeps through my windbreaker and into my very soul as my sister, Eliana, pulls me by the hand across the Golden Gate Bridge. I hate you, I scream through the four scarves around my neck. They don't seem to be helping with the cold either. Liar, I can barely hear her say through my earmuffs. You're just a baby. Why couldn't we live in L.A.? I mutter, and I curse her good hearing when she responds. Would you like an actual answer, or would you like sarcasm? Eli asks, pulling me along. Her hand is warm in mine, and when she stops and turns to look at me, it's almost like staring into a mirror. My identical twin's dark brown hair is under a hat. Her brown eyes twinkle for a moment as she raises an eyebrow before turning and pulling me once more. Cars pass us while we walk back towards San Francisco. Neither. I want the sun to shine, or... I pause as my teeth chatter. Something. Eli slows her pace and puts her arm around me. Come on, Andy. This is one of the last great wonders of the world, standing here in its vermilion glory for the past 160 years. I look up at the enormous towers we're walking under. Eli's fascination with vintage things never really interested me, but the Golden Gate Bridge is one of the cooler things within the context of her fascination with old stuff. I do enjoy her forcing me to watch classic movies, though. Soon there's going to be nothing but history and a placard saying, here stood the Golden Gate Bridge from 1937 to 2099, says Eli. They'll replace it with one of those stupid hover bridges. You do know they're safer, right? I ask. San Francisco's yearly quakes are pushing the old gold into the breaking point. The choices are down to either replacing the bridge or watching it collapse into the ocean along with whoever else is on it when that happens. Of course, but couldn't they have a little style? They're so ugly, Eli says, and I can't disagree with her. However, bridges are little more than slates of road with hard gray edges. Enormous fountains of GETs glowing green under underneath are what kept the bridges in the air. Green Energy Thruster is as unfortunate a name as it gets, and in case we didn't understand their environmentally themed name, the creators had to make them glow a hideous neon green as well. Locks on either end of the bridge keep the ugly things from drifting, but they don't add much to the view. I look at my watch. It's getting late. We better hurry or Dad's going to be upset. Eli leans over to look at my watch. She refuses to wear one, and it shows by the way she's late to almost everything. Fine, she says. She takes my hand once more, and we start running across the bridge. The movement gets my heart pumping, and by the time we reach the end of the bridge, I'm breathless, but no longer freezing to death. I see the welcome center in the distance. There's a sudden tug on my hand, and Eli lets out a shout of pain. When I look back, Eli is sprawled on the ground on her front. I turn back to the welcome center. Our dad's silver car is there, but he doesn't seem to be nearby. I rush back and pick up Eli. She's not weeping. We are 17, after all. But her eyes are tearing up from the pain, and I immediately see why. Her dreams were ripped before she fell, the holes revealing her warm olive skin, but now those bare knees are bloody and full of pebbles. And worse, she's nursing her ankle. I reach for it. Don't, she says, batting my hands away. He'll see you. Does it look like I care? I ask, but my sister's brow pinched together. He won't know. Eli flicks her eyes behind me to make sure our dad really isn't looking. Her face gets tight, but to my shock, she relents. Fine, she says. I reach for her ankle and wrap my hands hard around it. Eli grits her teeth, but I don't care about causing her more pain. Soon she won't feel any. Once my hands are firmly locked into place, her skin glows red, pulsing to the time of her heartbeat, centered in a lateral ligament on the outside of her ankle. It's starting to swell. It's sprained, I say, badly. My hands grow warmer, and under them, I know the tiny tears in the ligament are mending themselves. The swelling goes down, and soon the glowing red fades until a warm golden light emits instead. All better. Eli lets out a shaking breath and wipes her eyes. I stand and pull her to her feet. I'm about to ask how she is when I hear running steps behind us. Eli, Andy, our father stops when he comes near. Cameron Foster's brow is pinched. His light brown hair is perfectly combed and leads to, an, to his trimmed beard. At first glance, he doesn't look like our father. His fair skin is his most obvious dissimilar trait, but his green eyes also put him out of place with his two obviously Hispanic daughters. He immediately goes for Eli while I hang back. What happened, he asks. I just fell. I'm fine, she says, letting him study her. He gives me a double take and I wait for the inevitable question. You didn't. He looks around like he's making sure we're alone, or at least that no one saw what I did. My face grows hot. I didn't do anything, I say. I just helped her up. Don't lie to me, Andrea, he says through his teeth. His hands are on Eli's shoulders and his knuckles are turning white. She winces and pushes him off. 
I'm fine, Dad. Andrea didn't do anything, she snaps. Our father continues to narrow his eyes at me, and I try to look as innocent as possible. He lets out a long breath before his face relaxes. All right, all right. He puts up his hands in surrender. I just get worried. It's my job, you know. In more ways than one, I think to myself. I shrug as an acceptance to his apology, and he shivers. Come on, let's get you out of this cold. I'll look at your knees when we get home. He says before guiding us back to the car. I take one last look at the Golden Gate Bridge, hoping this isn't farewell. Paranormal. That's what they call us. I think there used to be some long scientific name for it, but that faded a long time ago. There are less flattering names, but paranormal is the most common. With how paranoid our father is, you'd think being paranormal was against the law. He wishes. To be fair, it must be hard to be a doctor with a daughter who can heal any injury just by causing a little pressure with her hands. I can't really do diseases or mental ailments, but sometimes I think I get a little stronger every time I use my ability. I honestly can't imagine how many heart attacks my father would have if I ever told him that. Eli reaches over and takes my hand. When I look at her, she's holding her hand up near her temple and she flicks her index finger toward the sky. Understand in sign language, code meaning she knows exactly what I'm thinking about. We head south toward Lindemar, our gray little town with its gray sky and gray ocean. The perfect day to go, say, go see Tia. Our aunt only lives a few blocks away, so we can be there and back before curfew. I know dad will want us to ask, but asking means he'll say no. By the time we pull into our driveway, the fog is thick enough to trap in a jar, and Eli grimaces all the way to the front door. Dad checks the mail while we take our shoes off and head inside. Eli's art projects, dad's unfolded hospital attire, and my soccer gear clutter the living room, making it impossible to move around in some places. You know he's going to say no, says Eli, as we move from the living room to the kitchen. The dining table is small enough without the added piles of unopened letters, this morning's dishes, and schoolwork. So we don't ask, I say, shrugging. Your ability to lie to him is mildly concerning, she says, hopping up onto the dining room table. I check the door. He's still outside. I wouldn't have to, with two simple solutions. If you stopped hating Tia and stopped hating the fact that I'm paranormal, I say. He doesn't hate Tia, she says. Or your ability. She adds the last part on too quickly. You're so naive. I roll my eyes and head into the kitchen as our dad comes into the house. His wide, even footsteps are a familiar sound. Right, of course. Sorry, sweetheart, he says to Eli, tossing the mail onto the table. He glances at me and swallows hard before looking away, and I shake my head before leaving the kitchen and going to the room I share with my sister. He doesn't like it when I'm around while he works, like it would give me ideas or something. While I wait for Dad to finish with Eli's knees, I take my soccer ball into the front yard through our screenless window. Screenless because I accidentally shot a game-winning goal through it while it was open last summer. It's a little warmer here, farther into the valley, and I'm moving too much to feel the cold anyway. It isn't fair that I'm the black sheep. I could do a million things right, but in my father's eyes, nothing will change the fact that I have the paranormal gene. Can't he look past that to see that I'm more than that? That I'm someone he's supposed to love? I kick the soccer ball so hard that it pings off the top of the fence, separating our ugly lawn from Mrs. Everhart's. My face scrunches in anticipation, and sure enough, as my ball drops into our yard, I hear something crash. Rosales, she screams, and I'm tempted to fall over and let the earth swallow me whole. Instead, I sigh and jump up on the fence, which isn't much taller than I am. Mrs. Everhart is standing on her back porch, hands on her hips with a cigarette dangling between her dark red lips. Hey, Mrs. Everhart, I say, sitting on the fence. Is that yours? She asks, eyeing my ball. It's lying next to a shattered pot that is thankfully empty, but I still destroyed her property. Uh, yeah, I say. I drop off the fence into her yard. I'm really sorry. She smirks and ash drops off the ends of her cigarette. She reaches inside her house before handing me a broom and dustpan, which might as well have my name on them. It's all right, kid. She sits in the sun chair, inappropriately named, as I clean up the mess. Something on your mind? Did you fit into your family? She laughs. Would you believe me if I said yes? Not after a laugh like that, I say, dumping the shards of pottery into the trash can around the side of her house. Sit down for a second, stalker star, she says, sitting up and crossing her legs. She pats the open space that's left on the chair. I pick up my ball and sit next to her. I thought life was hard at 17, too. Trust me, it's going to get worse. I purse my lips as she laughs at her own joke. She holds her hands out. Come on. I shake my head. Nope, not going to laugh at that. Fine, then. Some real advice, she says, taking the cigarette out of her mouth. Brush that dust off and get back up. It's what you're good at. I smile a little, and we both look over as Eli jumps up on the fence. She laughs. I thought I heard screaming. 
I got to make that thing electric, says Mrs. Everhard. Maybe it'll keep the Wonder Twins out of my yard. Don't be like that. Climbing over your fence and breaking your stuff is a time-honored tradition, says Eli, and that cracks up Mrs. Everhart. Thanks for the advice, I say, looking at Mrs. Everhart. I won't forget it. Sure you will, she says, standing and heading back into her house. But I hope you'll remember it when you need it most. I want you back in this house by six, our father shouts after us as we ride our bikes down Galvez Street. Unlike most kids, we still have to pedal our bikes. GET bikes are too expensive, but I wouldn't ride one anyway. Like the bridges, their design is just so bland. These belong to our grandparents and are still in pretty good condition. I don't turn and acknowledge Dad, but I'm pretty sure Eli does, which is good enough for me. Tia lives across town, but that's not very far in a town as small as Lindemar. We pass Sanchez Adobe Park and ride up toward Crespi. When we get to Tia's house, we drop our bikes onto the path leading to her front door, which she opens with a smile. We don't question that she was expecting our arrival. We simply run into her arms. Her skin is darker than ours, with more red than olive, but she has the same deep brown eyes and straight, almost black hair. She smells like fresh dirt mixed with the scent of roses and her perfume. She pulls us inside, still holding us. Oh, my sweet flores, she says, using the Spanish word for flowers. She always calls us that because of our last name, which is something our father allowed us to keep. She closes the door behind us, and we hang our coats on the rack by the door. Tell me about the Golden Gate, she says, and as Eli and I sit at the dining room table. She goes into the kitchen and starts making something. It was beautiful, Tia. You should have come with us, says Eli. No, no, not me. I don't do well in the cold, Tia says from behind the door of the fridge. She pulls out a jug of milk. Eli shoots me a look. Sounds familiar? I cross my eyes at my sister. You're cold-blooded like me, Tia says. Need that sun to warm us up. She comes to the table and hands us cups of hot chocolate. Then why are you living up here in the Arctic, I ask. Tia holds her arms out to us. Two reasons. Take a guess. We smile. After our mother died when we were five, Tia stepped in, and for some reason, Dad didn't like it. He didn't like her, to be specific, and I never understood why. We continue telling Tia about the Golden Gate Bridge, and she listens intently. When Eli excuses herself to go to the bathroom, Tia puts her chin in her hand and looks at me. How's your father, she asks. My mouth twists in annoyance and she nods. Give him some time. I scoff and I suddenly want to cry. Time? I'm 17. She grimaces at my truth. Fine then. I love you, paranormal or not. Your mother loved you too. She would have been so proud of you. I groan and let my head slump into my arms. Tia laughs. You're just like her. I lift my head. I miss her. Me too, she says. It must have been hard for Tia to lose her little sister. I don't know what I would do if I ever lost Eli. When Eli comes back, Tia takes us into the living room and shows us pictures of us with our mother. I remember a shadow of her, sometimes not even that, and it seems like whenever I try to remember her more, her memory gets farther away. Then when I see these pictures, it all comes flooding back. The real challenge is deciding which twin baby is which, and by the time I look up at the clock, it's 6.30. Oh no, I say. Eli sits up and lets loose a swear word. Hey, no swearing in this house, Tia says. Tia, we were supposed to be home half an hour ago, I say. The phone rings and Tia repeats Eli's sentiment, knowing it's our dad. She makes us laugh even though we're totally dead. The three of us jump up and we give her a quick goodbye hug and kiss before jumping on our bikes and racing home. We almost get run over, but all in all, it only takes another 10 minutes. We drop our bikes in the side yard and race around the house to find our father waiting for us at the back door. His arms are crossed and his face is as hard as a rock if rocks could be filled with anger. Eli, Eli and I shuffle into the house and stand in the kitchen while our dad sits at the table. He runs a hand down his face, and I wonder if this is really about us being late. Eli, I want to talk to Andrea alone, he says. Andrea? He used my full name? Has he already picked out my coffin? But I... Eli starts to protest, and I bump her shoulder with mine. No use in both of us being in trouble. Eli sighs before she leaves the room. I stand in front of my dad. The awkward silence between us fills, like, fills up like a balloon until it feels like it's the size of the room. What? I finally ask, growing impatient. I try to count on you, Andrea. I really do. You're the older one. I should be able to count on you, he says. My mouth falls open. Older? You mean those 15 minutes where I was magically bestowed with more responsibility than Eli? I don't like your tone, he says, his volume rising. It's not quite a shout yet, but it does shut me up for the moment. I don't think it's a good idea for you to go over to Trini's house anymore. Moment over. What? I explode. You can't keep us from her. She's family. I'm your family. Well, I wish you weren't, I shout over him, and his shocked silence allows me to continue. You think just because we're blood-related, we're family? 
at least Tia can actually look me in the eyes. You're so ashamed of me. I doubt many of your coworkers even know you have a second daughter. He looks at me out of the corner of his eye and his silence confirms my sudden suspicion. My eyes get hot and I blink tears out so I can see. Sweetheart, oh, save your niceties for Eli, I snap. Then stuff just starts pouring out of me. You have no idea how many times I've saved her life. Just think of all the times you could have been stuck with only me. His face grows so red, I think he's going to explode. But before he can, I leave the room. When I come into our room, I slam the door so hard the glass in the window rattles, and I lock the door before I give it a vicious kick for good measure. I have to pee, Eli says, holding out her hands. Then go outside, I snap. I want to break something, but there's nothing to break. I slump to my knees with my forehead resting against my dresser, which is next to the door. So maybe I was wrong about dad, Eli says. Is that supposed to make me feel better? She sighs and a lump grows in my throat. I'm never sorry that I healed your injuries, I say. I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, I know for sure that I wouldn't be able to feel my legs, she says, referring to the time she fell out of a tree and broke her back. That was the hardest injury I ever had to heal. In fact, I think I passed out afterward. She kneels next to me and puts a hand on my shoulder. Come on, you don't need him. I turn and cry on her shoulder and she wraps her arm around me. Big baby, she says with a laugh. I take a shower and go straight to bed without dinner. Eli says it's better that way. Dad didn't even eat anything. He just sat at the table, clenching and unclenching his fist, which sounds about right. I might have given him a stroke with my outburst. I don't care anymore. Eli's right. I don't need him. Maybe Tia wouldn't mind if I asked to move in with her. It's midnight. Too late to call her. I'll call in the morning. I'm about to go to sleep, but a car driving up our street flashes its brights into our flimsy shades. I flinch, thinking they'll go away, but they don't. I sit up and crawl over to Eli, who groans, as I look through the blinds. What? she asks. Some jerk is parked in front of our house. You should go tell Dad. Eli sits up and shields her eyes. We get to our bedroom door, but stop when we hear the front door opening. People are talking in deep voices, but I can't understand them. I think my dad is among the voices, but I can't tell. I instinctively reach out and turn the lock on our door, and it's a good thing that I do, because footsteps come down the hall, and they're not our dad's. When the person tries the doorknob, we both jump back. Whoever it is knocks on the door. Girls, asks a female voice. Are you in there? I'd like to speak to Andrea. Just me? Red flag. What do we do? Asks Eli. I turn to her. The window, I say. My heart beats so loudly I can barely hear my own whisper. We get to the window and I try to pull up the blinds quietly, but my shaking hands aren't helping and they make the blinds rattle. Eli gets her shoes on. Once the blinds are open, the floodlights of the car stream into our room, blinding me. The woman jiggles the doorknob again and just as I'm reaching for my shoes, people start shouting. They're trying to escape, shouts a man. Break the door down, says the woman. Eli throws the window open and jumps out. I forget my shoes and leap for the window as the door slams open. I'm halfway out when strong hands grab me hard around my ankle while the other grab my elbow. I scream and flail against whoever it is. Eli grabs my hands and tries to pull me through the window as my foot finds purchase behind me, and I kick whoever's holding me so hard they shout. They release me, and I sail through the window and land on Eli. I stand and pull her up, but that's as far as we get. We're both grabbed by men clad in black. They wear black helmets with reflective fronts to hide their faces. They clap hands over our mouths and drag us back into our house before forcing us to our knees in the living room. Dad, shouts Eli. When I look up, he's standing next to a woman who's about three inches taller than he is. She wears the same black uniform as the men do. Her hair is short, straight, and white as snow, matching her skin. Her gray eyes look between us. You promised you wouldn't hurt her, says our dad. She doesn't look hurt to me, says the woman. Which is she? The one on the right, dad says, not looking at me. One of the guards picks Eli up and shoves her toward her father, who holds her. She pushes him away. What are you doing? You remember your oath, says the white woman. My father nods once and his eyes finally meet mine. I think I'm supposed to be surprised, but really I'm just afraid. I look at the woman and when I catch her eyes, she gives me a smirk. What are they doing? Asks Eli as she steps forward. Let my sister go. She hasn't done anything. My father stops her from going farther as something cold presses against the side of my neck. I know she thinks she can help, but in this situation, we both know if she tries anything, something worse will happen. Eli, I say, and her eyes meet mine. I quickly jerk my hand free and give her our signal of understanding. She's the last thing I see before there's a loud clack and a sharp pain in the side of my neck. My vision fades to black. My goodness, I'm so totally hooked. I need to know what happened. And I'm I'm very curious that they're twins, but only one is a paranormal. I think yeah. 
that's that's <laughs> very interesting. I'm sure that's going to be developed somewhere down the road, I would think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so very cool, Sammy. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I hope that our listeners were hooked like I was. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This very, was so fun. <laughs> good. And so before you go, we'll bring you back on again when you get the second book and, and you and your sister get your first book together. Oh. And so let's stay in touch and we'll bring you back on. And um, also one more thing, give us one goodbye tip for aspiring authors, um, old or young, um, to keep going. What would you suggest to them? I would suggest not isolating yourself. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, going out and soliciting every person you come across to read whatever you've got. I would recommend finding one person who you trust who you know is going to tell you the truth. I love that. Such great advice. And I'm going to take it. So thank you. The advice is really for me, but my love benefit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Sammy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and we'll have you back again. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. Follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter where you can be entered automatically each month to win a signed free copy of a book from an author that's appeared on the podcast. You can find out more at our website, www.squishpin.com. And finally, if you're an author in the Pacific Northwest and you would like to appear on the show, you can find out more on our website. So until next week, I hope you enjoy the journey. This is Vicki J. Carter signing off.